Good afternoon, everybody. It's a, it's a great pleasure for me to, uh, to give this uh, presentation. So thank uh, the, organi the organizers for inviting me. And unfortunately, I won't be with you this afternoon because I just started my sabbatical at the moment you uh, listen to my talk. Uh, so I will be somewhere in Italy. Uh, but this, uh, this afternoon, I will talk not about Italy, but I will talk about uh, uh, home mechanical ventilation in the Netherlands. And I call it the so-called Dutch approach. What I will try to share with you is first to, uh, to, uh, to explain to you how it is organized in the Netherlands, because I think it's different in the Netherlands compared to other countries. I will talk a bit about the advantages of uh, the way we uh, set it up in our country. And of, of course, there are some disadvantages as well. And finally, I will, uh, at the end, I will focus a bit more on Duchenne patients and talk a bit more about how we deal with this patient. Do we treat them either uh, non-invasively or invasively? So tracheostomized ventilation. First about the organization of home mechanical ventilation in our country. You see here our small country, the Netherlands, and you see four different uh, divisions, uh, uh, four different uh, regions in our country of the northern part, which is orange. Uh, where I'm living and working in Groningen, it's in the northern part of our country. You see the blue one is in the middle, uh, pink is in the west, and uh, more green, yellow is in the south. So you see uh, four different regions, and it means that all the patients who need Groningen ventilatory support in our country uh, have, to be, uh, uh, have to be referred to one of the four centers, uh, which, is, which is linked, of course, to one of these regions. So for example, I'm working in the northern part in Groningen, which means that all the people are living in the orange part of our country have to be referred to Groningen if the physician thinks that patients need chronic ventilatory support. Uh, so it means that patient has to travel a bit to, to be referred to one of the four centers. And the other thing which is important, all the four centers we have in our country are uh, linked to university hospitals. So it makes it a bit more easy to do some research as well. One of the uh, biggest advantages I think we have in our country is the fact that we developed the Dutch guideline, which was developed in 2011. And we just had an update in 2021. And in this guideline, we, I think we discuss more in detail what kind of patient can be referred to, our, uh, to one of the four centers when the patient uh, uh, can or should be referred. We talk about the monitoring, the way we monitor the patient during uh, the, the, the phase they are uh, using uh, non-invasive ventilatory support or invasive ventilatory support. Uh, there are some safety issues being described and we talk about education as well. If a patient is being referred to uh, one of the four centers, uh, they will visit, of course, the outpatient clinic, and there they will see both the physician and the specialized nurses. Most of the time, as a, as a physician, I will uh, do blood gases and pulmonary function testing to see whether there's an indication to start chronic ventilatory support or not. And the nurses, the specialized nurses, uh, give a lot of information about home mechanical ventilation. And of course, as you know, I think maybe better than I do is that lung volume recruitment like air stacking and coffee machine is really important to, to start as early as possible uh, in this kind of patient. And even when the patient is not, does not need uh, ventilator support at that specific moment, I think it might be very beneficial to start this air stacking or coffee machine. So if a patient is being uh, seen at the outpatient clinic, there are two options. Uh, there is no need for chronic ventilator support at that specific moment. We have a follow-up and patient will be referred again or will be seen for, let's say, after three or six months again on the center to see in what phase he is. Is there some need for uh, ventilator support? Uh, either there is uh, maybe already a reason to start a non-invasive ventilation and then the patient will be admitted to the hospital to start it. Uh, the other thing which is, I think, very important as well is that most of the patients who are being referred to us do have their own physician and we always have sort of shared care model. So we are not fully responsible for the whole treatment of the patient. We taking care of the, the point of ventilator or support, but the patient will be seen by a pediatrician or a pulmonologist or neurologist or rehab doctor uh, on the same uh, in the same stage. The other point I think is really maybe it's not specific in our country, but normally uh, you can see it on the left side. We start a chronic ventilatory support in the hospital. On the other end, we believe that it's very, uh, well, not so uh, uh, comfortable uh, uh, to the patient uh, because the, they have to come to the hospital and they have normally, especially patients who are very disabled, 
they have a large team around them to help them with all the, 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 the things they want to do during the day. So if the patient is being, uh, uh, well, being referred to the hospital and we do the initiation of ventilatory support in the hospital, the patient leave the normal surroundings and if they, uh, well, they help when they are getting started with non-invasive ventilation or invasive, they come back with the machine and all things is, uh, is new for the people who are taking care of the patient for so many times. So we believe that it's maybe better and, and cheaper as well to do it at home. And you see below three different authors uh, did all the studies and where we compare the initiation of ventilatory support inside the hospital versus outside, which was mainly or uh, only at home. And all the three studies show that uh, the starting of non-invasive ventilation uh, is effective, is cheap, and, and is safe uh, to do it at home. And the starting point was not only only uh, being done and 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 the patient with uh, with uh, let's say obesity or COPD, but also in patients with neuromuscular disease. So patient with Duchenne uh, can start at home as easily uh, as they can start uh, inside the hospital. The other thing I think is very specific in our country as well, uh, that we have a national education program for all the patients who are having or are using home mechanical ventilation. It means that all the patients, all the people who take care of patients, so professionals, but also family caregivers, will be trained, will be, uh, will learn the skills in that to help the patient in the same way. And we call the sort of blended learning, which means that we have e-learning uh, techniques, but also bedside teaching. And I think it's really important that all the people are trained in the same way, because if patient is moving from one region to another, he will having the same care, he will, he will, he will receive the same care as compared to the region where he was living. So I think it's a very positive advantage how uh, we deal with, with this patient in our country. A bit uh, about the number of patients we have to deal with in our country. This is the total number of patients using home mechanical ventilation in our country. So it means these are not the patients with just sleep apnea or with OSA or central sleep apnea. These are the patients who are using ventilatory support. So it's, it's, uh, it's together all the patients uh, with COPD, neuromuscular disease, Duchenne, ALS, whatever. All these patients who need chronic ventilatory support are, uh, are being shown on this slide. You see there's a very linear uh, increase of the number of patients between 2012 and 2022. So it means we have around uh, 4,500 patients currently in our country being on a ventilator. When you look more in detail what, uh, what the, 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 the specific diagnosis is for the patient who is on HMV, you see uh, primarily, you can see this bar, uh, this is the patient with the neuromuscular disease or uh, the uh, neurological disease. This is the largest group, uh, as you can see here. And the smaller groups are patients with a thoracic cage problem, obesity, lung disease, or patients with sleep apnea. But uh, when you compare, let's say, 15 years ago, at that moment already, patients with a neuromuscular disease were the largest group, which is still the case in our country. This is, I think, a very important slide as well, because you see here the ratio uh, how patients are being ventilated, the ratio of non-invasive ventilation versus uh, invasive ventilation. And you see here that the number of patients who are using invasive ventilation, the red bars, is very stable over the last 15 years, while the increase is, in, in fact, only seen in the patients who are using non-invasive ventilatory support. The other thing I think we're very proud of it as well is that 84% of the patients who are using uh, non-invasive ventilatory, uh, ventilatory support is, is, is staying at home, living now. 84% of the group of patients is at home, which is, I think, very uh, fine for them. It, it will increase the quality of life and it's very nice for them to be with their, with their parents in case of kids or with, with the relatives. So if a patient is being on uh, a chronic uh, uh, ventilation, of course, we need information from both a machine, so the ventilator, if the patient is doing well. And you see on this slide, how we are uh, monitoring the patient. You see on the upper level, the pressures, so the pressures, how the patient is being ventilated. You see the average minute of uh, the average uh, breath number per minute. You see the tidal volume. So it gives a lot of information to us at the hospital, how a patient is being ventilated for the last couple of weeks. 
But of course, it's not enough to see only the, the, the readouts of the machine. I think it's very important as well to see how gas exchange is in this patient. So uh, on this slide, you see the CO2, carbon dioxide, which is a very important outcome that's in the doubt to be sure that patient is ventilated properly. And on this slide, you see that if you assess the transcutaneous CO2 with a sort of uh, sensor on your earlobe, uh, and we compare it with arterial CO2, which is a very invasive measurement, you see overnight, so the red one is the arterial line and the green one is the transcutaneous line, you see that over nine, the trend in both assessments are pretty the same. So this is the reason we are assessing, uh, in the past was in that we did a lot of arterial blood gas, which is very invasive, of course, but nowadays we rely more and more on non-invasive measurements to see uh, if the patient is ventilated properly or not. And this is more in detail, we'll show you a bit more. Uh, the upper level, you see the red one, which is the saturation. So this is a patient with, I think it was a patient with Duchenne without using ventilatory support. And this, uh, this, uh, this is showing that there is a desaturation, uh, desaturation till 60 or 70 percent. The green one is the CO2 line, and CO2 line is a bit high, you see around 10 kPa which is comparable to 70, 70 millimeters of mercury. So the patient is having a, a severe problem with, only, with not only oxygenation, but also with the ventilation. So when you keep this in mind, and when you look again on this slide, you see now the patient is using the ventilator during the night, you see this, the saturation is perfect, it's around 100%, and the CO2 is starting a bit high, but you see the decrease in CO2. So after a couple of hours, the CO2 is pretty normal. So I show it to you that in this way, we can uh, monitor the patient very, uh, very adequately uh, at home. He is at home. So this assessment of uh, gas exchanges during the night at home and uh, the outcomes will be sent to the hospital. And in that way we can be sure that the patient is ventilated properly. So if we talk about the organization, I think, and the organization has a lot of advantages, but there are some disadvantages as well. So first, the advantages, I think it's, it's a uniformity. So all the four centers are dealing with the patient in the same way. And uh, we have this unique training skills. I just mentioned to you that we have a unique uh, national training, uh, training system. All the centers are dealing, are, are helping more than 800 patients per center. So we have a lot of experience in the center. And I think the other thing, which is important with 24 seven coverage. So it means that every, let's say Friday night, there is a problem. They can always contact their specific center and to, to see what's happening and how we can help the patient at that specific moment. But of course, there are some disadvantages as well. I think there is some, might be some hesitation, maybe a bit uh, that the physician is a bit more reluctant to send the patient to a center because if they live around 200 kilometers from where uh, the center is, it might be a sort of burden for the patient to go there. So that might be, might give some delay. And the other thing, I think it's a very expensive system we uh, have to deal with. Uh, and uh, maybe in the future, it will change. On the other hand, I think the advantages are far more larger far more bigger than the disadvantages in my view. So finally, a bit more, a bit more uh, in detail about Duchenne patients, uh, how we deal with the patient, uh, are we uh, helping the patient non-invasively only or also invasive? On this slide, you can see the different ages the patient with Duchenne have. These are patients in our center. These were around 50 patients who start uh, uh, home mechanical ventilation in our center. And you see that patients some young patients start uh, uh, HMV at the age of eight, but you see also there are some older patients around 36 as well. And the point is at this moment, we have uh, the majority is being ventilated non-invasively. You can see on this slide. Um, this slide is in that you see the starting point of uh, uh, ventilatory support. So, this is only Duchenne patients, and you can see here that 77% uh, uh, of the patients start directly with non-invasive ventilatory support, and only 22 started invasively with a trach, uh, uh, tracheostomized ventilation. Uh, this situation changed because, and I look back, I think the first patient with Duchenne, we started uh, chronic ventilation was around 1990, 91 to be specific. And when you look at the first 10 patients, seven out of this 10 started tracheostomized ventilation. And when you look at the last 10 patients, we started a chronic ventilatory support. The last all started non-invasive ventilation. 
On the other hand, we have some patients who are older and uh, well, some prefer to have a trach. The oldest patient is around 50 at the moment, is still living at home, tracheostomized ventilation 24, uh, 24 uh, hours per day. So um, it means that although we uh, uh, start non-invasively and try to continue non-invasive ventilation, it's of course possible to take care of patients who have tracheostomized ventilation. One of the biggest reasons to, uh, to, to change from more trach ventilation to, to non-invasive ventilation is, of course, the, the, the physical therapy, the, this kind of techniques we can use. Of course, air staking is really important, and we started right away when they see the patient, even when there's not a real cough problem. I think you cannot start too early in this patient. Assisted cough, and the last one is important as well, the cough machine which is very effective, uh, maybe a bit more effective than air staking, but we always start with air staking, then later on we uh, can switch to the coughing machine if needed. The other thing which, is, uh, which gives us the possibility to, uh, to, to ventilate the patient non-invasively for 24 hours a day is the fact that we start mouthpiece ventilation, I think around 10 years ago. And I think it was a very interesting study by Michel Toussaint from Belgium a couple of years ago, who showed that if the patient is using mouthpiece ventilation during daytime, and you compare it with nocturnal ventilation with a mask, the work of breathing is, is reduced at the same, to the same level. So I think mouthpiece ventilation is very effective, and, and it means that we do not have to, to start tracheostomized ventilation too early. And finally, I think we're really proud of the fact that if we start uh, chronic ventilation in space with Duchenne. There was a study for 15 years already that even after five years, 70% of the patient is still alive, and maybe this is even a bit higher uh, nowadays. So coming to a conclusion, uh, I hope I've showed to you that we have a very uh, maybe a bit strict organization, but I think it's well organized with only four centers. Uh, these centers are highly skilled, have a lot of experience for many years. Uh, and I think the advantage as well that we have 24 seven coverage. So it means that the patients and also caregivers or physician can always call us if needed. And finally, the majority of patients is using NIV. Thank you very much for your attention. <laughs>